this is the very first lecture of the data basics uh, or data basics I don't know how to pronounce that the data basics um, module this is module B of statistics and introductory statistics we need to talk about measurement scales measurement is not what people think it is so we need to really work it out well it is what you think it is but it's more I need you to understand the basic concepts in measurement uh, I need you to distinguish between numerical and categorical scales you need to know the difference if it's a numerical scale you're going to need to know whether that's continuous and discrete now that's somewhat important but it's actually quite critically important if it's a categorical scale to distinguish between nominal and ordinal in other words between unordered categorical or ordered categorical and then finally, um, one of the last objectives is to understand the difference between treating an ordinal scale as numeric and treating scales constructed from many ordinal scales as numeric. We might not make it to that objective in this particular lecture, but we'll see how far things go. Here's another of those basic principles that everybody loves. The nature of the data determines the treatment of the data. Um, I don't recall if we've seen this yet. This is a pretty critical thing. This is going to run throughout the entire semester and definitely during the next week or two. You have to know what the data is to know how you can appropriately analyze it, for instance, or, re or represent it. You often hear people in psychology or statistics talking about a scale that say, oh, what, what are the psychometrics of that scale? Have you worked with that scale before? Is that scale valid? Sometimes they mean a specific questionnaire. But in a statistical sense, a scale is something else. A scale is a system of measurement. And there are different kinds of scales. So, um, we're going to learn about three types of scales with kind of a, a subdivision of one of those kinds. When you measure something, it's more weird and interesting than most people realize. Now, most people don't understand that measuring is pretty complex from a cognitive and even philosophical standpoint. We observe something in the world, and then we make a symbol about it. It might seem kind of obvious, but that gap between the observation and the symbol is pretty critical. We need to understand what the thing is that got observed, and we need to understand what the rules were for making the symbol from the thing that was observed. So if you're looking at some numbers on a paper, in order to know how to analyze those numbers, you really need to know what the thing was that was observed and how the researcher or the observer um, decided what to write down. So the symbols we usually use are numbers, but there are lots of other kinds of symbols, words, little smiley faces, and frowny faces, colors, whatever. Later, after the observation is done, all we have left are the symbols themselves, and we need to know uh, what happened. We need to reconstruct the crime, as it were, and find out how those symbols came to us, where they came from, what they mean. The observation is gone then we need to know how those symbols were turned into, or how those observations were turned into symbols. The process of turning observations into symbols is measurement, or, and the specific choices you make in any given case are a measurement system or a scale. And we're really concerned with how much information is in each scale, it is in each symbol. You can't measure everything about whatever it is you're observing. Say you're observing people, and someone says, what are you doing? And you say, people watching. You can't watch everything about them. What are you watching? Simultaneously, you know everything about how they walk, how tall they are, what the color of their clothes is, what their apparent ethnicity is, their sex. You're noticing uh, how quickly they got from here to there. You're noticing their smell. You're noticing the color of their eyes, the color of their hair. You're listening to everything they say. It, you can't. It's just ridiculous. There are an infinite number of things to pay attention to. So we choose, every time we get a group of things or events or phenomena or whatever together to observe, we have to choose a characteristic or more than one characteristic to observe about those things. And when we measure one characteristic from a whole bunch of related something or other things, events, people, phenomena, all those observations, those measurements that we collect together, we call them a variable. I will often say a variable is a characteristic. So critically important is what information and how much of it from the observation itself and from the thing that we observed is encoded in the symbol that we wrote down or typed into a computer. That's what we're going to be worrying about for the rest of this lecture. There are at least three kinds of information that might be encoded in the symbol. So let's go through those three kinds. And if you can understand these three kinds of information, then you can understand the three kinds of scales that are most important to understand for this 
for this lecture or for this class. Now, one thing to remember is that there are different methods um, of describing scales. But uh, this is really a, a, a really reasonable approach. It's not the only method of describing information in scales, but it's a very reasonable approach, this three scale system. There are others, a very popular four scale system. I'm not going to go into that. It's really similar to this one. The first kind of information that might be included from the observations in the symbols that were written down, it might be included in the measurements, is information about differences between the observations. So if the cases, each case is like each person, or if it's rocks we're observing, each rock is a case, or if it's one person and every time they pick their nose, then a case is each nose picking. So if each case naturally might be different from each other case on the characteristics, so there are potential differences between the cases on the characteristic you're measuring. So this isn't, I'm looking at people and they're all different, so oh, there's a variable. No, the question is, what characteristic are you measuring about those people? Like, what if you say my variable is, do they breathe oxygen, yes or no? That's dumb. Of course all the people breathe oxygen, as long as they're all alive. So if you're looking at a bunch of live humans and your variable is oxygen breathing, yes or no, that's not a variable. And it doesn't work with any kind of scale because there's no potential for difference. Everybody's going to have the same value. Whereas you say, how much oxygen do they breathe per minute? Now you've got yourself a variable. So if there's any difference between the cases or potential difference on the characteristic, then you observe that characteristic and you use separate symbols to record each group of cases that are similar to each other in the measured characteristic. Now this is really abstract. So a quick example, let's say you're observing, observing leaves and the thing you've chosen to observe about them is their color and you've decided that the categories are red, green, brown, orange or yellow and you have people judge or you can use a spectrometer and see which color is the closest. So leaves could be different in color, especially during the fall. So you use um, the separate symbols, the easiest symbols are just writing the words. If the leaf looks more orange, you write orange. If it looks more brown, you write brown, etc. So all the leaves that are orange get the word orange written in your notebook or in your laptop. All the leaves that are brown get the word brown. This should be making some sense. So for example, if you have, um, if you're measuring the sex of individuals, then you write male for all the males, female for all the females. This overlooks the question of how you found out whether they were male or female in the first place, but we can gloss over that for now. If you're looking at a whole bunch of cars and you're measuring the make of the car, then just write the make of the car. That's easy. Uh, now you could be all clever and say, I'm going to use numbers to encode something that isn't really numeric. So person's religious uh, background or religious affiliation, I'll enter one for the agnostics, two for the atheists, three for the Christians, four for the Jewish. That's perfectly valid. And in older systems of uh, software, you had to use numbers all the time. You couldn't enter words. It was a limitation of the computers and the software. That's no longer the case. Every computer, in any system worth its salt can handle some numbers. It's not a big deal. Um, with SPSS, it's fussy because SPSS was written in the 60s and hasn't been updated as much as it might have been since then. But anyway, you see people doing this. That's okay. Just remember that you can't like add those numbers up together. You can't take an average of religion. Oh, the average of religion is 3.6. What? Makes no sense. But still, it's valid to use numbers as long as they're different for each group. Now, the next kind of information that might be included in measurements is an inherent order. This is one step above, one piece of information more than was in the previous ones. It only works, of course, if the characteristic that you're, that you're measuring has an order. You can't say religion, I'm going to measure the order in religion. I mean, you can't say a person's biological sex, I'm going to measure the order, male or greater than female. The thing has to be ordered in the first place. There has to be a natural order to it. But as long as there is a natural order, then just use a symbol system with an order. Now, often you just use numbers. That's the easiest thing. So if you've got something that's higher than something else, give it a higher number. Something that's lower than something else, give it a lower number. It's actually pretty common in social psychology to record attractiveness of individuals. You usually don't want to be the researcher who decided how good looking the undergrads are. So instead, you get a bunch of undergrads to rate each other on attractiveness. 
And people are incredibly consistent about that, and they agree with each other quite a lot, so it's a pretty easy thing to do. And so you usually just say, like, on a scale from 1 to 10, how attractive is this person? 10 is more attractive, 1 is less attractive. So numbers are pretty nice. If a particular case, then, is higher or greater, or has more of, or more intense of, anyway, some kind of quantitatively different on that characteristic than another case, so let's say with the attractiveness example, if uh, some people are looking at one man and they think he's more attractive, than, you know, the third man they see is more attractive than the second man they saw, then the third man should get a symbol that in the symbol system means more. So, more attractive, maybe this person gets a 7 and the previous person only got a 6. If it's lower, then use a lower symbol. So, I'm using a, a slightly excessively complicated way of describing this, but I think you might see why we need to break this down so carefully later. So here are some examples. If a, if a car finished second in the Le Mans, write 2 for second place. Now remember, in this one it's bizarre because second place is not as good as first place, even though the number is bigger than first place. Weird, huh? If a person agreed with a statement on a survey, but not a lot, maybe write agree. If said or strongly agree. Maybe if they agreed less, write, uh, or disagreed a little, write disagree, something like that. If a participant is, is um, very charismatic, maybe they have a scale that goes from 0 to 5, and they get a 5. When they're only a little charismatic, maybe write a 3, and if they're not charismatic, write a 0. It's important that you have very clear structured rules. I'm just listing a few sets of rules here. You can't just go by the seat of your pants. You have to make up some rules that make some sense. So now the final piece of information. We have differences, and we have an inherent order, and now regular intervals. So differences, order, and intervals. Regular intervals, if you have measures that are already ordered, that there's a natural order, and in addition, it's possible to measure the amount or the level or the intensity or something of, of the characteristic, measure it very precisely with a high degree of reliability, then you can assign numbers to the observations, not just based on whether one is more than the other, but on exactly how much more than the other one or less than the other ones it is. So you can use your number system and make it work a little harder for you now. Instead of just using one, two, three, four to indicate that you know, one thing is higher, another thing is lower, these things are higher than the other three things, you can say this thing is 2.56 times higher than this other thing, or this is 3.75 points lower than this thing here. You can get really specific. But that means that the number system and the observations underneath it have to support this. So it has to be meaningful that if you write 5.5 for one thing and 10.5 for another thing, the second thing should have exactly five more of whatever it is you're measuring than the first thing. So if you record that one inch is 5.5, or sorry, one worm is 5.5 inches long and another worm is 10.5, yes, then one, the, one of those worms has exactly five inches of length. Length, inch is an arbitrary unit, but that's okay, it's a very measurable very quantifiable arbitrary unit. That second worm has exactly five inches more in its length than the first one does. On the other hand, if you're having people record attractiveness and you say one person was a, a 10 and one person was 11 and another person was between a 10 and 11, one person was a 5 and one person was a 6 and this person was between a 5 and a 6. And so the in-between ones you say, well, she was between a 5 and a 6 and we gave her a 5.5. And this other person was between a 10 and 11, we give her a 10.5. Okay, you did that, and it looks like you've got regular intervals, but you don't. It doesn't make any sense to say that the second person is exactly five points more attractive than the other person. Or even that the 10.5 attractiveness is really exactly halfway between an attractiveness of 10 and 11. You can't say that. There's no way to know whether those units are regular. Examples of this kind of scale are pretty much everything that we think of as measurement and numbers outside of the social sciences, especially any physical measurements, any percentages, uh, any time you count anything, the number of this, the number of that, any time, like seconds, minutes, hours, years, these things are uh, all have regular intervals to them. Now, just because you can't measure precisely due to your tools doesn't mean it's not a numerical or, or regular interval type system, so keep that in mind. So this leads us to these types of measurement scales. You've got categorical measurement scales, 
sometimes known as nominal or regular categorical or unordered categorical. The only thing those scales encode is the difference between two things. And you can do that with pretty much any kind of observation that's out there. Now, if you have observations that are naturally ordered, then you can use a measurement system that encodes that. And then you have an ordinal scale, or sometimes known as categorical ordered or ordered categorical scale. But then if you have uh, observations of things that are truly quantifiable, specifically quantifiable, that, that support this concept of regular intervals between the numbers, then you can have a numerical scale. Numerical meaning the numbers are truly numbers. They're doing what numbers are supposed to do. This is sometimes known as an interval scale or an interval slash ratio scale because there's a, a different system of talking about scales that has four points and numerical is the top two. And in that system they're called interval and ratio, but we almost never distinguish those two. So this three, three point system is the best for us right now. So we've got this system here. You've got all variables that can be divided into categorical, which is regular or order, depending on which type of categorical, or numerical. But we need one more distinction, unfortunately. And it's not as important because it's still numerical. It doesn't make it a different kind of numerical. It's not a different kind of information encoded in the same way that we've been talking about before. But it is important to pay attention to. You need to know whether a numerical scale is continuous or discrete. Actually, sometimes you don't need to know that, but sometimes you really do. So a numerical continuous scale is a scale where the numbers have spaces between them that are infinitely divisible, infinitely splittable into smaller spaces. So any physical measurements worth work like this. So for instance, if you're measuring length of anything, let's say it's length of worms, if you just have a really funky ruler, you might say this worm is three centimeters. If you have a, a better, more precise ruler, you might notice it's not really 3.0 centimeters, it's 3.5. If you have an amazing ruler, now we're talking about electronic objects and laser measurements, maybe the worm is actually 3.51 centimeters, or maybe if you have an even more precise one, it's 3.507 centimeters, not quite 3.51. You see what I'm saying? You can get more and more and more and more precise by dividing the spaces between the numbers. Gross domestic product, we could talk about it in real general terms and say it's 125 billion, or you could say it's 125.6 billion, or you could get much, much more specific. Technically, you can even get down into fractions and even smaller fractions of a cent. So it's infinitely splittable. Money and value like that is splittable. This doesn't mean you are always capable yourself in a particular situation of measuring everything so precisely that you can split infinitely. Your measurement ability always tops out because of the tools that you have. So your ability to measure precisely is always limited. But at least conceptually, a continuous scale can keep being divided more and more into finer and finer divisions and more and more precision. A discrete scale is the alternative to that. It's where there are certain numbers that, that are on the scale, and it's, it's a numerical scale, but it doesn't make any sense to divide the spaces between the numbers. So let's say, how many nations are members of the UN? You wouldn't say like, you know, 46.7 nations, actually. I don't know how many there are. That number was made up. You can't have like a 0.7 of a nation. You can't have a 0.5 of a nation. You can't have half a nation. Either a group is a nation or not. You can say, well, but Liechtenstein, come on. How is that an entire nation? Well, because the concept of nation isn't tied to population or geography. And it's pretty much a yes, no thing. You're a nation or you aren't. So if you're counting the number of nations, you can't split that. Same with the number of children. Even though I'm sure you know families or possibly in your own family, there's one child who you think, well, Given that person's life decisions, maybe they don't count as an entire... No, you can't do that. They're, they're still a complete and entire human being. So you can't subdivide that. So there are, there are certain types of things that you can measure. And frequently it's just counting, where you can't really subdivide any further. It doesn't make any sense. And so those are discrete scales. But actually, the way you analyze discrete and continuous scales is identical. So knowing this concept is helpful, but it's not critical to your life. Now, here's a visual representation. Here's a continuous scale measuring the number of kilograms of chocolate pudding that I ate last year. I don't know. So we can say, did I eat 12 or 13 or 14 or 15, right? I can just stick with whole numbers. But if I wanted to, I mean, kilograms is infinitely splittable. It's a physical measurement. Weight is a quantity that can go all the way down to like 
the Planck constant scale or something, the subatomic scale, you, you can keep splitting that nearly infinitely. So you could break it up into, you know, fifths of a kilo. You could break it up into tenths of a kilo. You could break it up into twentieths of a kilo. You could break it up into fortieths of a kilo, which is, I think, what's going on there. I lost track. Anyway, you can keep dividing and dividing and dividing the spaces, and you can, get, and therefore you can get more and more precise. Instead of saying I ate fourteen kilos of chocolate pudding last year, you can say I ate fourteen point seven three nine kilos of chocolate pudding. So a discrete scale, for instance, and again, I'm just counting because that's the easiest way to have a discrete scale. Like the number of protesters arrested uh, this protest last week. Again, you can just have these numbers, but dividing them up doesn't make sense because it doesn't make sense to divide people. It's still a numerical scale because the gaps are regular. The distance between 12 and 13 protesters is exactly one protester. The distance between 15 and 16 is the same. It's exactly one protester. All the gaps are the same size. All the differences between individual numbers are the same. They're mathematically regular. However, the values between the gap, between the numbers in the gaps don't actually make any sense. You can't divide any values or even talk about values. What's the difference? What's what's in between 13 and 14 protesters? Nothing. There's nothing there. You have a 13 and you have a 14 in the end. So here we have this entire system. Let's talk about the categorical scales and maybe we can finish this in another 25 minutes. But this is a pretty important lecture so I didn't want to break it up too much. Ooh, what have I done here? There we go. Um, we have regular categorical or unordered or normal or nominal scales and that's where measurements represent only differences, only categorization. The only property you have is that differences property. And it actually doesn't make any sense with this kind of a scale to put the observations in any quantitative order. It doesn't make any sense to say one is greater than the other. A classic example is a lot of demographics. Okay, some classic examples are a lot of demographic measurements. So what religion you are, that doesn't make any sense to order. What political affiliation you have, despite the arguments that we occasionally have with people who used to be our friends, that doesn't make any sense either. There, there is no natural order of Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Green Party, things like this. Um, the type of job you have, there's no natural order to that. These are just varieties. They're just multicolored differences and diversity in the world. They don't imply, there's no way to meaningfully make one greater than the other. So your sex, your ethnicity, your nationality, all of these things are examples of scales or variables that don't have any natural order to them. So it doesn't make sense to talk about them as being ordered at all. And in fact, you should be careful not to attach numbers unless you're forced to by your software. Attaching numbers gives the illusion of order, of you know up and down kind of order, quantitative order, when in fact it doesn't exist in the data itself. Now, if you have... Um, a characteristic that is naturally ordered and if you recorded that natural order using numbers or something similar then you have an ordered scale, an ordered categorical scale, an ordinal scale. So you know when one characteristic has more of something than the other but you don't know how much more. And that's actually pretty critical because you don't have equal intervals. You don't have mathematically regular intervals. By the way, you don't have to have equal intervals for a numerical scale but you don't even have mathematically regular intervals. So the intervals between the categories are not regular, or if they are regular, you can't prove that they are, so you better not treat them like that. So some examples in psychology, the big one is Likert scales. If you have a Likert scale item, like uh, a question that says, how much do you agree with this thingy? Very strongly disagree, strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree, strongly, very strongly agree, that kind of thing. That's a Likert scale item. The difference between very strongly agree and agree looks like one, but is that really the same size as the difference between, say, agree and and uh, strongly agree? Or the difference between disagree and strongly disagree? There's no way to prove that it is. We'll talk later in the, in the semester that actually there are ways to kind of get an idea about that, but in general, those are orders. Olympic medals, gold, silver, bronze. Obviously, gold is higher in esteem and winningness than silver, and silver higher than bronze, but that doesn't imply anything about the difference between gold and silver, or silver and bronze. They're pure order. Winning a race, winning the Olympics, 
that's a pure ordered variable. There's no way to talk about the gaps between the numbers being regular in any way. So in the textbook, you read that ordinal variables cannot be numerical and that there are no statistics uh, that are intended for numerical data that you should ever use with an ordinal or ordered categorical scale. I'm just telling you, follow this rule. Even though, in reality, not everybody always does, and sometimes there are reasons to break this rule, but you don't really know much about that right now, so follow this rule. If you see a Likert scale item, just one by itself, do not calculate a mean or a standard deviation on it. Don't make a histogram out of it or a scatter plot out of it. These things should not be used um, as if they were numbers or numerical scales. So you need to be able to look at a verbal description of a measured variable and determine whether it fits or where it fits in this scheme. You have four choices, really. And the most important are between numerical and then the two types of categorical. Less important, but still kind of important, is uh, continuous versus discrete. That's, that should be your goal for after this video. I'll just end with this principle that you're going to see about 400 times.